Okay, so let's start with the Big Bang. Now, if it is true that the universe started off with a Big Bang and it just expands slowly, then it should, uh, it should expand linearly, okay? But what we see is this. First of all, the universe, it expands weirdly, okay? It's more like this. So as it expands, different parts move faster than other parts. That makes no sense. Also, certain galaxies, okay, galaxies, move faster than other galaxies. This makes no sense either. So, the way that astronomers have explained away these statistical problems is to introduce a new concept called dark energy. And dark energy is most of the universe. It's, it's like at least 80%. Some scientists believe it is 90%. So most of the universe is composed of dark energy. And of course you're like, what is dark energy? And the answer is, we don't know. Now, dark energy sounds like we don't see it. That's not what it is. It's we don't know what it is. And quite honestly, it's cheating, okay? So let me give you an example. Let's just say you take a math test, and the teacher asks you 1987 plus 25, and your answer is 20, okay? That's obviously wrong, right? So your teacher says, this is wrong. And then you say, oh, I know how to fix this, plus dark energy. Problem solved. Okay? This is like literally what cosmologists are doing with dark energy. We don't know what it is, but they say it must be there because otherwise we cannot explain these statistical inconsistencies in our measurements and modeling. And then of course you're like, well, why don't you just say that the Big Bang Theory is wrong? And they're like, well, we could say that. The problem is we don't have a better model. Well, in fact, there is a better model. The better model is there are different Big Bangs. Okay? So if you just assume that there are different Big Bangs, well, this helps us understand what's going on better. But then the question then, then is, wait a minute, if there are multiple Big Bangs, why are there multiple Big Bangs? Okay, so our current system of understanding the universe simply does not work. And the problem is that it's become a paradigm, a story that is accepted by most scientists and they refuse to budge on this issue. Okay, but I'm telling you right now that this system is clearly problematic and it could be wrong. Okay, so that's a problem with um, the Big Bang. Now let's move on to evolution. Okay. Evolution. Now, in theory, evolution does work and it works for most animals, except when it comes to human beings. Okay, because that the, the idea of evolution is gradual progress. But we don't know how we went from the ape, okay, to the human. We share with the ape, other monkeys, 99.9% .9 of DNA. But we don't know why we're so different from the ape. Okay, that's the first problem. Second problem is humans have been around for, for about 200,000 years years, okay? That's a long, long time. We only have maybe 50,000 years of history. So where do the other 100,000, 150,000 years go? We don't know, okay? So this is also another huge problem with the theory of evolution. The third problem is, according to evolution, there should be many different types of human beings. But in fact, there's only one, Homo sapiens. Now what scientists will tell you is, well before there were different 
species, the Neanderthal, the Cro-Magnon, and then gradually Homo sapiens took them over. And that's, and you can believe that, but it's problematic because according to evolution, there should be many, many different types of humans, okay? Maybe some with six fingers, some with three eyes, like animals. Okay, so the lack of diversity in the human species, it's a, it's, it doesn't really fit into the evolution model, okay? All right, so that's the problem with evolution. The real problem is with the human mind, okay? So let's go over some of the problems. All right, so with neuroscience, what they teach you is that what the worldview does, that's very important, is that it filters memories. Okay, the reason why is every day you're absorbing a lot of experiences. Your, if your brain were to absorb all the experiences, your brain would explode because there's too much information to process. Therefore, your worldview pro processes different experiences. It differentiates between experiences that uh, are important and experiences that are not important. And experiences that are important, of course, goes into your long-term memory. The problem with this is, how about babies? In theory, babies should not have a worldview. They should not have a personality. But if that's the case, then how do they process memories? How do they know what memories to store, what memories not to store? Okay? The other thing is that I have three kids, and I can tell you that they're all distinct personalities. It seems as though they were born with a worldview. And then the question then is, where does this come from? Your eye color, your hair, your height comes from your parents' DNA, right? So does your, is your personality from your parents' DNA? Probably not, okay? Just ask yourself, am I a composition of my parents' personalities? You're not, you're a different person than your parents. So this is a huge problem with this model. Where does the personality come from? And why is it embedded in us from the very first day? Okay? What's more problematic is how we think. Consciousness. We do not have currently a model for how we think. In fact, if you study neuroscience, you will find there are a lot of gaping holes in our understanding of the brain. For example, we do not know where the brain stores memory. That's very unusual because the memory is a building block of everything. But we don't know in the brain where it is stored. Yeah? Isn't that hippocampus? No. The hippocampus? No, it's not. We, we, we don't know where, where it's stored. There are certain things this, that we know where it's stored. For example, we know where maybe language is stored. We know where faces are stored, okay? So maybe the faces are stored in the hippocampus. But we don't know where memory is stored. Okay? So what we say is the entire brain stores memories. But that's another saying, we don't know where it's stored. All right? So the other thing is that our current model of the brain, it's like a city, okay? Think of the brain as a city. And what makes the brain work are the roads, or what we call the synapses. When they hit each other, it has, it creates electricity. And that's where we think that um, how thought is generated, okay? But this is problematic because um, we think a lot, okay? So let me give you an example of this to clarify. Now, in science class, you're taught the scientific method. Okay, what's the scientific method? Well, you do research. You create a hypothesis from the research, and then you create an experiment to test out the hypothesis. And then you have data, and then you make observations, 
and then you refine the hypothesis, okay? And this is what we believe a way to model the act of thinking. And you're taught this in every class, even in, in English class, right? You do research, then you create an outline, right? The outline has a thesis with three evidence, right? And then you write it out, write a draft, you edit it, and you repeat the process. Okay, this, this is what you're taught in school. Okay. I'm gonna say something that shocks, that will shock you, okay? This is what you, you're taught in school. This is what you believe works. But as someone who is much older than you are, as someone who actually thinks for a living, who teaches for a living, who writes for a living, I'm gonna tell you, how you actually think is the complete opposite, okay? So what happens is you actually, you actually think or imagine the story or the idea to begin with, okay? And then you start working backwards to create the process. Okay, you're taught in school, it's a process that creates the, the idea. What I'm telling you is that in reality, it's the idea that creates the process, okay? So let me give you an example of this. If you look at Every major scientific discovery, it all came to the person in a dream or when he was, or it sort of popped into that person's head, okay? It's just think of a light bulb, light bulb popping up, okay? So an example is Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein created his theory relatively not in a laboratory, not by um, doing research with other scientists, but simply by sitting in a patent office every day and just daydreaming. And then, boom, the idea came to his head. He's like, okay, now I have this idea. Now what he's gonna do is go back and look for the evidence to support his idea. Yes? Okay, um, is a hypothesis the idea? Okay, no, the hypothesis is the assumption, okay? What, okay, what, what I'm trying to tell you, tell you is this. What I'm trying to tell you is the idea or the final product comes first. Then you go backwards, okay? And you create the draft. Then you create the outline. Then you do the research, okay? Now, I know this sounds weird, but let me give you more examples. James Watson came up with the double helix model of DNA. How he did this was he spent years and years working to figure out how DNA worked. And then boom, one day he had a dream of a staircase, a double staircase. And he's like, maybe that's the model I need to use. And then he started to do more research and he discovered, hey, this works, okay? But the question then is, how did that get into his head? Okay, let me give you another example. Um, I write books, and I've written three novels. Um, and you won't believe this, okay, but, but my wife is here, and, and like she knows how I work. You would think that when you write a book, you would spend every day at the, at the desk, and um, read books, take notes, and then transform it into a book, right? I don't do that. What I do is I lie in bed and I might play some video games or I might read a book, okay? I get up, I walk to the park, and I come back and I have all these ideas. And I write down all these ideas over one hour, two hours on the computer, okay? And then I'm exhausted. I've run out of ideas. And I'm like, okay, tomorrow, what am I gonna do if I have no ideas? I can't write anymore. But what happens is the next day I get up and I have new ideas. And I write it back, and I write it down again, okay? So it's not like I am generating these ideas, it's more like I'm receiving these ideas. If you watch me, actually watch me work, it is almost impossible to think that I actually do any work. Because I'm always like lying around, or walking around, or daydreaming, okay? My wife tells me that when I write, or when I work, it's like I'm possessed. 
I'm possessed by something, okay? Meaning like, I actually, I don't see anything and I really don't know what other people are doing because I don't care. I don't care because I'm focused on my work, okay? Also, I'll give you another example, the way I teach. Now, when you see me teach, you think, oh, you must have a script. You must have outlined the class. I don't do that. I have a conception, I have a framework in my head. I come to class and I teach. How do I teach? I watch your observations, I watch your facial expressions, and based on your responses, I then start to flesh out the framework. And how, how, and, and how do I do that? Because I'm always accessing a higher force and I'm receiving this information that I can then articulate to you in class. And that's why if you have been with me for a long, long time, 10 years, you will know I've never taught the same class ever. You can go on YouTube and watch all my videos. I teach the, this class different each time. Because each time, what I'm doing is I'm channeling a higher force and bring it to you. But it is a conversation, it's a dialogue. And it's no different from reading a book or seeing a great painting, okay? Each experience is unique because when you, because a painting or the book, it's almost like a platform for you to experience the divine or higher power. Okay? When you read a great book, that's literally what you feel. You feel as though you are in conversation with the universe. And this book is really a portal into the universe. Okay, if you read a good, great, great book. I'm not sure if, if you had, if you had uh, read a good, great book, okay? So, if you want to really be creative, you have to trust the universe. If you really, really want to destroy your creativity, you follow this system. Okay, so what I'm telling you, and I, I know this, this is gonna be weird, but school, it destroys your creativity because it teaches you a process that does not work. No scientist in the history of humanity has ever come up with a great idea using the scientific method. I guarantee you. They've all came up with a great idea through their imagination, through their intuition, by channeling the divine. Okay, that's every single scientist, including um, Einstein, Newton, uh, yes? But I, I... Wait, wait, sorry, sorry, sorry. Can, can, you, can you speak to the... Okay, so I agree with what you're saying, but I, uh, personally, I, I, I think scientific method is more like how people, how these inspirational ideas are being presented to others. Oh, yes. Yeah, good point, exactly. That's, that, that's exactly correct, okay? So I use scientific method in order to convince other people that I'm correct. You're absolutely correct. Because I, if I told people, oh, I had a dream, well, like, it's not convincing, okay? So the scientific method, it's a way for, for us to communicate and spread ideas. You're absolutely, you're absolutely correct, okay? But as I say, you will never, ever have a great discovery by following the scientific method. You have to have an inspiration. And then you use the scientific method to explain your inspiration to other people. 